Excellent. Welcome to the Metasploit demo meeting for May 1st, 2018. Uh, for some of us, this is kind of coming back refreshed after a vacation. For some of us, it's been after kind of a push. For some of us, it's been uh, after a move. So <laughs> for, for everybody here, it's a little bit of a different story, but uh, a couple of announcements to begin with. Uh, we had five contributors, uh, excuse me, five uh, folks who stepped up to the Google, Google Summer of Code program. Uh, and uh, they submitted projects that were kind of, some of them along the lines of what we were expecting. Uh, but I personally was very impressed with the quality of the proposals that we got in terms of uh, their goals and uh, what they had outlined to accomplish over the next few weeks, as well as uh, even providing some particularly detailed timelines of what they wanted to accomplish and kind of milestones along the way. Uh, so obviously it's very early in the program. I think it's a few weeks before they get started, um, before you know rubber really meets the road. But um, yeah, we're absolutely looking forward to that. Uh, along those same lines, we've had a lot of contributors who returned uh, over the last couple weeks, so I wanted to take just a moment to, to call them out. I know Auxilius has been uh, really hitting it hard. Yeah, he's uh, been super busy lately. Yeah, uh, so I know uh, there was a lot of uh, code in the PS exec that kind of got migrated out of the individual exploits and converted to uh, its own mix-in, and that's a big help. It helps us really consolidate a lot. Uh, for me personally, it kind of drives me crazy when uh, Commands don't do, you know, like they just aren't as polished as they could be. And one of those was the route command that, uh, you know, if you tried to enter a domain name that didn't, uh, wasn't resolvable, uh, it just didn't have clean output. And so little stuff like that, I think, is, is just, you know, a big help. And so hopefully uh, he can kind of contribute that. That'd be fantastic. Um, I know we have a couple other contributors who are, are working on things uh, at the moment. Um, and we'll kind of talk about those as we work our way through. Um, but yeah, good things, and we'd love to see our contributors coming back. As far as things that landed, uh, we'll obviously be going through a lot. We've actually, uh, in contrast to last demo meeting, uh, we've got quite a few uh, demos in this one lined up. But I wanted to call out one here, uh, which is a pretty simple change, but since a lot of folks use Eternal Blue, I wanted them to uh, see kind of this new output here. Uh, and that's that with Eternal Blue, when we do some target fingerprinting, and for instance, if you specify 64 bit, uh, but the fingerprint uh, suggests that it's uh, x86. Uh, you'll get back a message uh, that just kind of says, hey, um, how sure are you about that? <laughs> it also will even tell you it's possible that AV caught the, the exploit in progress. Ooh, uh, we, added, we added that as a, as a mill check. Okay, that's really cool. Because it turned out that's what the underlying problem was. We built, will build, build this as part of uh, uh, trying to diagnose a problem someone was having, like, the exploit's not working. It's like, oh, yeah. It was uh, so that's pretty cool. And so if you see that, now you know what to, what to expect there. Uh, we had actually quite a few exploit modules, uh, and I won't burst anybody's bubble since I know a lot of these are going to make it into the demo. Uh, but, you know, certainly Drupal Geddon has been making the rounds uh, and so we've made a lot of progress there. Uh, there's a, a pretty uh, well-polished exploit for Xdebug, a PHP debugging platform. Uh, and so that one landed, uh, perhaps with a little bit of egg on our face, but uh, we're, we're always happy to see new contributions regardless. Uh, there was a vulnerability, uh, well, I guess a, a in the way that MSFD works, if it's uh, deployed in a uh, very insecure configuration, um, then it's possible to get remote code execution by MSFD. Uh, and there was a really kind of interesting uh, implementation of that using a browser. Uh, uh, basically, if you can redirect someone to a browser page, uh, that it would talk to the MSFD uh, kind of uh, service and, uh, and get a callback from that, which was kind of interesting. Um, and then, yeah, a couple other just kind of small things with uh, Asus. There was a, a, a telnet, I believe it was port, like port 9999, um, that uh, you can trigger uh, an off bypass. Um, yeah, so a couple, couple of exploit modules and a lot more on the way, too. Uh, I know Jake had been working on one for a little bit that was a Git stack uh, REST API that let us list and add uh, users uh, to Git stack. Uh, and so that's that one uh, landed. Uh, Brandon wrote about in the blog post, uh, our weekly wrap-up blog post on Friday, uh, the WLAN probe request. So I guess the idea being if you are uh, if you have control of maybe a machine inside an enterprise environment, and you're trying to figure out, you know, maybe it's a laptop somewhere, and you're trying to figure out where physically it is, uh, this is a way that you can uh, have it generate some, a WLAN frame just to put out a little probe uh, so you can watch uh, the RF spectrum and, and figure out, triangulate where it's at. It's kind of cool. Uh, I wrote on the wrap-up uh, two weeks ago, or yeah, the 
second to last wrap-up, uh, about the APFS encrypted volume password uh, module. So this lets you pull back Apple uh, file share uh, encrypted passwords that were dumped in the system log. So that's going to be plain text, and that's pretty handy. Uh, quick update to enum protections. So now uh, on a Linux environment, uh, this is a module that kind of surveys the system and tells you if there's any kind of uh, countermeasures deployed, and, and now we have support. Now, th th there are a, a number of additions to that, and I know one of them was Tripwire. Yeah, um, one of the kind of more interesting things, it's really more of a plumbing thing, but uh, Brendan Coles has been working with some other members of the community, uh, him and Hoodie and, and some others, on a, a brand new Linux post-exploitation API around like uh, enumerating things inside the kernel, enumerating things inside the the system, and uh, now we kind of have common methods that any kind of post-exploitation module can use inside of these environments, and it should make up adding more modules like this a lot easier. Cool. Yeah. <clears throat> and then one that's pretty simple, but uh, for me was kind of a, a, a good kind of back-end thing, was as part of the MSFD, uh, to those two MSFD modules, uh, we got a upgrade to our Ruby payload. Uh, so our Ruby, for example, our Ruby Verge shell now uses base64 encoding. Uh, so in that case, that vulnerability needed a, uh, you know, couldn't have uh, sure, new lines. Yeah. And yeah. so, yeah, now base64 encoding, that's not a problem. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of handy. Uh, a couple things coming up, come down the pipe. Um, I know Auxilius is working on uh, a wireless AP uh, module that will pull back the list of uh, Wi-Fi SSIDs uh, from an Android device. Uh, and so that's in the queue. Uh, I noticed there was uh, Nagios, uh, there were actually, it looked like there was uh, four vulnerabilities in mm -hmm. Nagios that this particular module targeted. Um, and so I think it might be being split apart at the moment, if I understand correctly. Okay, that, 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 make, that would be consistent with what I saw, yeah. So that's going to target quite a few versions of Nagios, uh, but that'll be, that'll be handy. And then a couple of privesks, uh, one for uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux and a second that's specific to Ubuntu 14 and 16. Um, so those, those will be handy to have as well. So uh, did I miss anything? I guess we can kind of, as we work through the teams, we'll, uh, we can delve into the holes. But um, so yeah, with that, let's kind of move on. And uh, Dharma Initiative, let's talk about what, uh, what we've done. <laughs> you you I, take a break? I'm gonna take a break, yeah. <laughs> would, would someone like to talk about what Dharma Initiative worked on? We can kind of pass it around. Sure. Uh, so some of the stuff uh, over the last couple of weeks, we've had a really big push, or I guess almost the past month now, uh, for the Drupal Gettin Drupal 2. Uh, and then while we were working on Drupal Gettin 2, uh, Drupal Gettin 3 came out, and we've made uh, some pretty good progress on that. Uh, some ease of use stuff, uh, like uh, being able to uh, set a session by name from either the code or the command line versus having to always look up its index. Uh, which uh, is pretty handy to have uh, if you don't want to keep remembering like where your indexes are starting or it's just give it a name and uh, a lot easier to remember or script. Um, and then we've got the uh, xdebug unauthenticated RCE, uh, which was pretty fun, always uh, good, uh, always fun to find developer tools that are not written securely. Uh, because those boxes always have lots of goodies on them. Uh, and we're making the final push of uh, Ruby SMB, getting that integrated to add SMB2 support to uh, lots of the aux modules, the login scanner, um, and some of the uh, more uh, fun things like PS exec. Cool. Thanks, Adam. Script kitties. Uh, I can handle that one. Um, so last couple of weeks, we spent uh, quite a bit of time helping Axelis uh, kind of organize his thoughts on how we were doing the PS exec mix in, trying uh, trying to make that a little more independent. Um, we got that landed uh, beginning of the week. Um, uh, we also landed some uh, ability to install antiviruses via the uh, uh, Ninite um, default installers um, on DM automation samples that allows us to build out uh, an, an antivirus lab a little bit more quickly, a little more effectively. Um, uh, all that code's actually been landed in VM automation as samples. To use it, you do need to download the, uh, the Nanite um, uh, executable packages directly um, to get an installer that doesn't need a whole bunch of interaction and accounts and all those fun little things. 
Um, and then we worked, uh, we're working on uh, getting the commercial release out. We found some bugs last week. Um, we delayed it a little bit to pick up the Drupal Geddon uh, revisions that are coming out this week. Uh, that should, should be uh, making a real good progress this week to, to get out and get, make it available to the community. And, and Sonny, I, I read this, uh, restarting a social engineering campaign. Is, is, is that true? That's awesome. Yeah, I, in fact, I will be demoing that a little bit later. All right, cool, looking forward to it. Nice, excellent. All right, so abnormal form. Um, what have we been working on? We, uh, so we recently landed support for doing notes and workspaces remotely. Uh, the workspace one was kind of a, a more architectural change on how workspaces were specified, or yeah, specified in the DB manager. Um, <clears throat> you may see some underlying bugs that uh, shake out of that, but that's mostly because uh, it's something obscure hasn't been updated to use the new uh, format yet. Basically, the workspace attribute needs to be passed most of the time if you're doing anything with the database. Um, so if, if a bug pops up with that, just let us know and we can, we can get that fixed up. Um, we added uh, validation when registering and setting the data service. Basically, if uh, <laughs> the way it worked when it first landed is as long as it got a 200 response back, it would uh, think that it was connecting to a valid data service. And um, then when it would try to actually pull information, it would just crash framework. So uh, Matthew added some validation there to make sure that it's a, an actual legitimate uh, Metasploit data service instead of just any web server in the world. Um, PR open to add remote data service. Uh, oh, so. Uh, Chris added a, put a PR up to actually enable uh, RSpec testing using the remote data service, so it'll actually use the HTTP uh, database requests instead of uh, just going through uh, directly to Postgres. Uh, working on documentation of the API endpoints. Um, we're, uh, I'm gonna demo this later, so I'm not gonna talk about it too much right now. I'll give more information there. And uh, this is a big thing. Um, we're starting getting ready to get started on making changes to the data model. So we're putting out a survey to the community to um, kind of gather feedback on what people are looking for and what, uh, you know, where we kind of want to lead these changes. So um, that should be getting announced shortly. So any feedback that people want to provide would be very helpful for us uh, going forward. Cool, I'll post that link in the comments. Cool, thank you. Uh, Sonny, that would mean you're up if you want to talk about the social engineering campaign we start. Yeah, sure. All right, can everybody see my screen? Yep. Mm -hmm. All right, so let me give a little bit of, of history um, on the problem that we were uh, trying to solve with this fix. So as a social engineering campaign is this idea that you have a target list of people uh, for whom you want to send emails out to fish them. And in the real world, you know, things happen like uh, we might lose connection to the mail server, the SMTP server, or sometimes the web server um, uh, might have some glitches and might go down. Um, we got lots of, of feedback, especially from our own folks using um, Metasploit social engineering, that their, their only um, remediation was to restart the entire campaign. Now, the catch was it, the campaign would actually send out all of the emails again to the entire distribution list or the target list. And if you're trying to be stealthy and try to fish someone, uh, it's a little bit, uh, it might give it away that, that the email is a phishing email. So this work, essentially what it does is it uh, remembers where the campaign left off um, and will start sending from the last uh, person who, who has, uh, hasn't been sent yet. So what I have is a social engineering campaign that's configured for a target list of three, just to make it simple. Uh, and we're using an external uh, SMTP uh, server provider. And so when I start the campaign, um, I've got it set to only send one email at a time. So just a little bit of history on that. To be a little stealthy, um, Metasploit has a couple settings where you say, I want to send out um, X number of emails at one time, and I want to wait, let's say, five minutes in between so uh, an entire organization won't get all the emails at one time. Um, and again, just trying to be a little bit more stealthy. So when I start the campaign, you'll notice that it says I'm going to send it out to three emails. Again, the target list is, is three people. 
uh, are you sure you want to send it? And I say, yes, I want to start the campaign. And let me go over to the task log. And you'll see that the email was sent just to the one person uh, so far. And um, I'll go ahead and say done. Now to simulate uh, some sort of interruption, I'm gonna go ahead and stop the campaign. Uh, in the real world, this might have been, uh, like I mentioned earlier, an interruption with the mail server or the web server. And this time, um, if that were to happen, then I would click start again. And you'll notice now, because I've sent one, that means I just have two emails to send that are remaining. So when I start that again, I go to the task log. You'll notice that the email was sent to the second person. And again, we're only sending one at a time. So in essence, it just picks up where, where it left off. And you can see here that only two people were targeted so far. And this is, uh, this is the demo. Any questions? No, that's great. That's going to be a, a great help, uh, Sonny, when, when people do run into kind of like, you know, reliability issues or, uh, you know, something happens in the middle of a campaign. That's, that's going to be a, a huge thing. Thanks a lot for working on that. Yeah, yeah. we've sure sure. got a lot of customers with this request uh, mm -hmm. around, you know, around the years of this script. Another benefit you'll see from this is when, is, is, is when, you, when you stop or, or, or have a, a, a failure of the service and need to restart it, it will reattempt any, 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 any email that was not actually sent. Okay. Um, so if, there were, if, if you sent, attempted mm -hmm. to start, you started it, you let it run, and it attempted to send five of them and four of them and errored. When you stop it and you start it again, it will reset. It will reattempt to send those four. Oh, good okay. oh. cherry pick. Nice. So, so it, it, it simply, it, it, if it got confirmation from the SMTP server that it actually sent mm -hmm. that message, then it marks the marks the user as having been sent to. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, when you restart, it restarts the list. Oh, that's, that's very cool. Yeah, good point, Jeffrey. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Sonny. Uh, James, you want to go? Yeah, sure. <clears throat> so you're talking about uh, documenting the Mistplay API? Yeah, so um, let me get this screen shared. All right, so we released the Metasploit API a little over a month ago um, is when it landed in master. Uh, and I don't know if anybody's really used it yet. So um, we uh, were thinking that maybe it's probably because there's no documentation for it uh, at this time. So. Um, we talked amongst the team and decided, uh, and, and also um, with the rest of Rapid7, like the Insight platform and stuff, most of them are using some sort of Swagger, uh, sorry, Open API documentation, formerly known as Swagger. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, they changed the name. Um, Why? Swagger is just the, the UI front end now, but they, and, the, and all the tools that they make to generate Open API. We'll have to rename the exploit module then. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, I looked, there, there's a ton of tools out there that can help generate uh, the documentation. I found one that's called Swagger Blocks. It's a Ruby gem that uh, uses a DSL to um, generate the Swagger doc uh, JSON from code that you write in here. It's pretty simple. Um, you just have uh, different blocks with keys for various properties. Um, and then you define each of the uh, endpoints and how to access them. You can also define the model, uh, which is right here. So this is the JSON schema that's going to come back to the user. Um, and this is all running inside of the Metasploit uh, DB um, WS uh, program that actually hosts the API. So you have the API documentation right there with you. Uh, this is what it looks like once it's all done. You just hit this API docs uh, URL. Um, and it gives you all of the endpoints that are available. Um, I just haven't documented everything yet, but um, I'm still working on that. Uh, so, and, and the cool thing about this is you can click into this, it'll show you all of the uh, parameters that it accepts, um, whether they're required or not. It shows you an expected JSON response. Um, and you can actually make uh, like commands through this. Um, so you just give it a workspace. Um, Execute. It'll give you a curl command that you can copy and paste, or uh, the actual URL you can hit. And then this is actual data coming back from the server, so it, it just hits it and you know, returns uh, exactly what would show up. So, Swagger. Oops. Just so, to prove that this works, I will. Yes. 
And it's the same data that's showing up over here. So, so hopefully people can use this to get started writing some integrations with the API and um, uh, you know, getting used to it just to play around with it. So it, it'll all be self-contained and really easy to access. So. Do we have a blog post or something that allows that shows, you know, shows the query that we have done this effort and but it's not at all? It's, it's not available yet. This is still running on my laptop yet. I haven't put a PR up. I still have to finish the documentation for a few of the models and, and clean things up. But um, still yeah, have a I think your that's a good idea. Let your laptop through the firewall. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can probably post it on the netsplit.com. Um, I think that was one of our original intents behind that site was to post all the open source documentation. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Programming documentation. Yeah. That would be great. So you made a comment uh, at the start of the demo that you, you thought folks weren't using the API and Jay Brewer was asking, uh, he was just chatting, like, how do we know that people aren't using it? Like, do we have any? I mean, we haven't seen anybody talking about it. I haven't seen any chatter about it. No issues coming up or anything like that. So I'm cool. I'm cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. We haven't found the bugs we left in. Yeah, the assumption is that nobody's using it because nobody has said that they're using it. We haven't, I mean, there's totally a possibility that it's just, you know, totally intuitive and, and it just works out of the box. It perfectly <laughs> the first time. Yeah. <laughs> we did kind of put it out as a stealth release to see, like, what, what did we not catch as far as, like, normal usage breakage? And yeah. we've actually, over the past few weeks, fixed a lot of things that we didn't realize were actually things people used in the first place. So we, yeah, it's, it's, it's also there. not in any of the uh, default installed or distributed versions. You have yeah. to do a source yeah. install in order to get it. Yeah, we told Kyle Linux and some of the other big distros to just hold off of pushing this out to like millions of users just while we can work out some of the local bugs. <laughs> yeah, so we, we, we've seen issues come in that they're, they're based on using the console. We haven't really seen a lot of issues come in from somebody saying, well, I didn't bother to use the console. I sent this data at it in some other way, and that, that would really be the only way we'd see that someone's using the API yeah. so far. Yeah, Jay also said uh, Tau can help with the API docs, and Conrad's yeah. command is doing something similar. Um, and he, I wanted to know, do we monitor these things in platform analytics? No. This is framework, and there's no, we don't collect any customer uh, usage for framework. OK, cool. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? No, I can't I, wait to use it and yeah. find some bugs. <laughs> 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 this is great. This is, this is opening up a lot of opportunities for, for, for integration. Yeah. Our users and um, and other even open source projects. This is this is a fantastic opportunity. So uh, you know, like probably we should ask in Twitter. You know, Caitlin. Um, you know, what else would they like to see or stuff like that? I don't know. Like well, now that would gauge at we, least we how much. Have an actual, uh, survey we're about to put out. Yeah, yeah. yeah. ask you like, like, today or tomorrow. Yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah. So that that would be that would at least give you an indication of who's using it or yeah. if you know about it. Yeah. yeah, and and once the API is published, there, there there would be access logs and things that we could we could do on the on, on the S three buckets or whatever that are just, that are providing it to be able to tell us, hey, people are actually consuming this. Mm -hmm. Good stuff. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, Will, did you ready to go? Uh, did you need a second? Yeah. All right. So uh, I'm going to be demoing the Drupal Geddon two vulnerability, which. Uh, now there's a three, I guess. Um, but there's a three and a four, right? Yeah. Uh, I think there's only a three. Uh, this one is pre-auth. It affects pretty much all versions of Drupal 6 through 8. Um, it is pre-auth, so you don't require authentication. Uh, simply point it at a website, and you get a shell. So uh, at the lower right, I'm going to be running uh, a little bit of a TCP dump. Um, should show you some requests. I don't know if it's really useful there. Uh, some IP addresses up above it, so I can remember. <laughs> and uh, here we go. So you start by using the module. Hey, it worked. Good. So info on it, uh, quite a bit, actually. Um, you can see it supports multiple platforms. Uh, main interesting thing. The targets uh, has 12 targets. Uh, there's not really a great way to um, split it up right now. So everything's up here. The first four are automatic, which means you simply point it at a URL and fire away. Uh, you don't have to set the version. You don't have to set pretty much anything. Actually, it'll, it'll try to auto set payloads to um, um, 
in a, in a sense. Um, you have a few different options. In memory means that it's executed without touching disk. Dropper obviously means that it touches disk. Um, there's another delineation between um, uh, two types in, in memory. Uh, there's in process and not in process. So normally when PHP is executed, it's either executed within the Apache process as a module, um, a mod PHP I believe, um, or it's executed as like a CGI script, so it shells out to a PHP binary. Um, in process means that your PHP will be running within a process, it won't create a new process. And um, other than CGI, of course, uh, but it, it should be a little bit more stealthy as well as being in memory still. So uh, it takes a few different options, dump output, you can dump the output of the, uh, basically responses. Uh, if you're using pass-through, which is a default here for PHP, it will send all your data back to the browser, or in this case, Metasploit. Um, and uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. Um, some uh, references below, which are pretty good reading. Um, it took about two weeks for the proof of concept to be released, which uh, was kind of stunning, but it kind of required Drupal expertise to really find the code path to exploit, even though it was clear that this is how we can create a payload for this, but where do we inject it? We had to find the points for that. So pretty straightforward, set our host, I believe we're gonna try 757. Yeah? That's just the TV. Oh, never mind. Never mind. Right straight for here. Uh, Three, um, I like to set verbose. That's another option, because it'll print pretty output and stuff. Uh, there's a check command. You can see some requests below here. Um, it's a little chopped off, but that's all right. Uh, you can see it found 7x running at that URL. Uh, it checks to see if the patch is installed via changelog.txt, which is usually not removed. Um, even Drupal says, a Drupal website, the documentation on it, the official documentation says you can't really, I mean, you can remove it as much as you can, but people will be able to fingerprint you anyway. Uh, yeah, so it uses printf instead of pass through, so it's pretty safe, doesn't execute a command, simply prints a string and checks in the, uh, you can see bottom right, there's a string, a random string, um, and it says it's vulnerable. So, um, you can see, let's, this is PHP in memory, so why don't we use, oh, I gotta do that target by name, get that here, um, set target to, this is the one I started with, Unix in memory, so we can set our payload to command, oh, I'm gonna clear my screen again, command Unix, um, if you didn't see, I set my target to number, Two, zero indexed. Set target two. Um, set payload command Unix generic, which lets you basically run any command. Set command ID uname. Actually, I'm not going to do that because it's running in Docker. Just new ID, um, and then run. And you can see uh, it runs pass through. It encodes away bad characters with echo dash e. Uh, there's your www data user. You can basically do set command to, I don't know, echo vulnerable a la shellshock, run. There's your line. But that's not really cool. So set target zero, zero set payload, PHP interpreter, reverse, let's do that. Set alpha. Oh, I'm going too fast. <laughs> um, there's your shell, um, and I have verbose enabled, so it shows it's trying to do a cert first, which will only work for certain setups of PHP and Drupal. Um, I think only 7x I got to work, uh, but there's your shell. It takes a little while to return here. I can actually control C this, but let me get here. Um, and um, there it is, <coughs> PHP shell. In fact, you can get PID here, it's 26. You can see it runs within the Apache process because it's running from mod PHP. Um, uh, sure, we'll exit it. Um, show targets, let's try something else. Uh, 
Um, and that was a PHP interpreter, by the way. Set target. Um, we'll do the da, 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 drop for drop. For, we'll do the native one. Um, Linux, oops, x64. I should not have typed with that. No, that's too slow. Oh, I already set that. Didn't I? Okay. So uh, the assert, I think. Um, oh, here it drops it using file book contents with base 64. Uses include once include the PHP, which writes the binary payload to disk. Um, and it runs in process because it a uh, because it sends a GET request to the PHP file. Um, if it can't find that, then it'll it simply execute with PHP CLI at the command line. There's your shell, and um, I won't run sysinfo again. But it is actually native interpreter metal running x64 on the system. Um, also, you can see it's running in memory again. There you go. Um, drop the shell and stuff like that. Right. Oh. Yeah, that's pretty much it. Anything right. else? Questions? Yeah, yeah. 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 Brent, so last week we talked, or last two weeks, last demo we, we talked really briefly about Metal Sploit, but I didn't want to uh, spoil any of the surprise. Oh, thanks. I so. appreciate that. <laughs> um, what we're basically talking about is, uh, is a different interpreter implementation that we wrote. Uh, so typically, the different interpreter implementations that we have are like in PHP, as you saw earlier. We have ones written in C. We have ones written in Java, um, targeting Android. We have ones written in Python. And they target different kinds of exploitation scenarios. But because we had two interpreters written in C, we had to come up with a way to distinguish them from each other. So we ended up calling one of the interpreters metal um, to kind of say like it's you know it very tough and resilient and um, you know cool or <laughs> something like that. And it's really metal because it runs on bare metal. Um, so uh, it's just kind of a fun fest. But Metal has some interesting features that you may not know about. Um, one of the features that it has is um, the ability to parse command line arguments. If you generate a payload, normally um, what the payload does is bake into the payload from the very beginning. Um, but with Metal, it actually has a command line dispatcher. Normally, if you run it, it's, it's quiet, right? It doesn't do anything. You don't really know what's happening. But if I do dash H, this is kind of funny. Look, it actually has help. And among those things in the help, you have some actually some handy, <coughs> excuse me, handy commands. Like for instance, you can install persistence. You can write it in the background. You can rename it. We actually showed that at a previous demo where we made metal show up as the IR agent. Uh, you can also, of course, uh, connect it to various URLs. You can actually give multiple URLs and have it uh, connect to sort of a network of different endpoints to uh, to basically create a new session. Um, you can also, of course, hard code a UUID if you want to make it look like a particular um, instance of a payload running in the world. But um, for this particular demo, I'm going to be showing a couple new options that I added as a pull request. Um, the idea behind this is that, um, as we've been doing a lot of work over this past year around making it so that Metasploit modules can run as external processes, at the same time, we've also been adding the ability for Metal to load extensions. And the way that Metal loads extensions, like for instance, if we do packet capture or uh, uh, keyboard uh, keystroke capture or even write an extension in a different language, um, that's not a whole lot different than the external module support that we've added as part of the project Coldstone. So given that we have all these pieces to put together, why not make it so that the payload can actually run a Metasploit module directly? Um, you know, the, uh, the API is pretty well defined. It's just JSON back and forth and just talking over a standard, standard API, standard pipe. So what I basically did is I added two pieces to Metal. Um, one of them is a console. So now if you start Metal, you actually get an interactive console and you get a little, little guys just kind of shrugging at you. Now, something you might notice is that, um, you know, I have commands. I can type help and tab complete, and it shows me different things. I can look at job management, see what's running. I have a data store, and there's actually nothing in the data store, and so I don't have a module set. I can type info and, you know, that kind of stuff. Not very exciting without any modules. So let's try adding some modules to it. Um, I surely have something like this in my history, and there we go. So for this demo, what I'm going to show is actually Metal doing multiple things at the same time. I'm going to see how many plates it can spin on its little uh, CPU finger. Um, 
just kind of go over what's in this, the command line. First of all, I have the dash C option, which starts with the console. The second thing I have here is the dash M option, which basically tells it where the Metasploit modules are. So Metal can actually um, scan Metasploit's module API or module, module library and find modules that it can run itself. Apparently it's limited to Cold Stone modules, but you know, potentially someone could embed a Ruby interpreter and maybe in, include even more support for, uh, for, for um, the, the normal Metasploit modules. Um, and then the final bit, of course, is uh, you can actually retarget Metal as well. So I've got this, uh, it's kind of wrapping around the screen. You can see here, I'm, I'm telling it to connect um, over TCP to port 444. Now, just like a, a good cooking show, I happen to already have a handler here listening and waiting for an incoming connection. So let's go ahead and start it up and see what happens. So in here, I, I have a console now, and I can type uh, help, and I can still do the same thing. And I have an interpreter session over here too. So there we go. Um, let's see, um, webcam, I don't know, take a snap. I always like to take a picture myself just to prove that it's actually live and not just a simulation. Um, yeah, exactly. So there we go. Um, <laughs> you're too slow, Joe. Um, or maybe, maybe the session was too slow. But, but you might also notice here you can also type use. And, and this will actually tap complete all the modules that was able to load out of Metasploit's module library. Here's SMB Loris. Oh, look at there. It exploded. So um, something to kind of note here is that Metal doesn't package all the, uh, all the uh, underlying dependencies that you might need. So in this particular instance, I don't have, um, it's saying um, some sort of Ruby dependency installed. So uh, it is currently using your underlying system interpreters to, uh, to do the right thing. Let's try Haraka, that's, that's Adam's favorite module. If I were to type info here, you can see it actually works properly because I took the step ahead of this demo to make sure I had Python paths set properly so that this guy could find all these libraries. But you can see here, it's just actually talking to the module just like it was a regular Metasploit module. In fact, I can type set and I get the different data store options as well. I could target myself. Um, I could set, uh, I don't know, let's, let's try running it and see what happens. So you can see here, it even can actually intercept all the errors that come from. So here it says, I got an error from the module. It says, you didn't set the command option. So let's set, set command. I don't know. Um, command uh, monkey. I don't know. Let's run it. So here it was trying to create a connection. Um, what I'm kind of trying to point out here is not so much that this is going to be a failure of a demo, but really more like where we're at in the development process. So I've gotten all the kind of the, the, the nuts and bolts of running the module. There are things regarding like say pushing a payload from within the payload um, that need to be set up and, and stuff along that, that, that line. Um, let's try a module that will actually do something interesting. So I'm going to type use, actually I'll start it up again, use, I don't know. Oh, there we go. That's a good one. So our host. Actually, that one's not going to work either. Let's try SMB Loris. There we go. That's my favorite one. <laughs> so let's see. Use. How about Claymore? Is that our host? There we go. There's someone who's actually running. So anyway, he, he tried to make a connection, tried to denial of service my, my local um, Bitcoin miner. And obviously I'm not running a Bitcoin miner, but um, yeah. And of course the jobs have exited. If the job had continued running in the background, we would have seen the running job and all that kind of stuff. But this is really just the basic framework for basically having a, an interactive console that runs Netflix modules that is actually the payload. Um, this whole functionality so far added 200 kilobytes to a metal, so you can basically get a full interactive console and the ability to run modules within that much. Uh, future plans are, one, I would love to get it to actually report data from the modules, and given that we now have an API documentation for, for Goliath, um, I'm thinking that this will probably be a good connection. Um, another, the next thing, of course, I'd also like to add to this is the ability to um, handle sessions because if you can handle sessions from your payload, then you can basically use it as an interactive shell to just uh, jump from jump post to jump post and, uh, and basically maybe even aggregate sessions from, uh, from the edge of the network within the rest of the network. So lots of good stuff down the line. Um, I think it was a pretty good first start and I hope you guys enjoyed it. Any questions? Will. How does it run the modules that you say it uses the system interpreters? So yeah. So, so it, shell out, kind of? it does shell out and runs the module as a subprocess. As a subprocess, okay. Mm -hmm. Yep, just like framework does. Yeah. So it has the, the capability because it's using the same metal code that, that does um, the, the process creation. It can do a hollowed out process where it just does it in memory, yeah. or it can do it as uh, an on file. So it's not actually loading any code 
into into its own store. Yeah, it creates a and then in fact when it created the data store, it creates a per module data store. It never creates a global data store, so they're always isolated from each other. It's, it's a little bit of a different um, architecture than the Mesweb framework. Oh, yeah. Any other questions? I have a dumb question. Yeah. Uh, why should I? Why would I use metal instead of multiple framework? Well, um, one reason is that it started in a fraction of a second. Okay. Um, <laughs> and another reason why you might use it would be because it's really lightweight. This is eight hundred kilobytes. Okay. So to to run this whole subsystem, and really, I guess the bigger thing, and this is hopefully down the line, I don't want to like get people's hopes up too much, but um, people have been asking for the, the concept of asynchronous mm -hmm. modules for a long, long time. And the idea behind asynchronous modules is I want to be able to, say, for instance, I want to push down a module to my payload and have it like maybe collect some data like every hour, but then only report like back every, I don't know, every day or every week or something like that. And that way you don't have all this sort of like signaling that kind of, you know, highlights that you're on the network and, and reduce bandwidth and that sort of thing. Um, if we have the capability for to run modules remotely as part of a payload, then that module can just sort of live asynchronously by itself and collect all the data. And with a tool like Goliath, where we have a nice RESTful API, eventually that mod, that payload could wake up, report all the results of the module, and uh, we'd have a nice little thing. We actually support this kind of in Metasploit today. For instance, if you were to run the, the Android payload, you can actually have it collect GPS coordinates like once an hour, and it stores them in its own internal database, but there's not really a formal place to store that. And in fact, it's all kind of custom commands to get that data back out of it. Uh, this basically gives us more of like a way to run modules in general in asynchronous mode as well. So that's kind of where we're looking at on the horizon. Nice, nice. And is it anyway more sturdy than Metasploit framework, or? Well, it, the idea here is that it's running Metasploit framework modules, but running them apart from framework itself. So if you can just push a module down, disconnect completely from the network, and then have yeah. the module run oh, okay. internal to the network without having this external sort of you know red flag. Cutting communication, yeah. Yeah, yeah. you can cut communication and run things asynchronously. Okay, okay. Payload. So the link trees are like this, yes. Exactly. And of course, you, that's how you be web scale as well, right? <laughs> yeah. So, anything, any other questions? All right. Thanks, everyone. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. Do we have any other demos today? No? All right. Yeah. Well, well thanks. This was an excellent demo meeting. Thanks thank for you putting guys. it together, Aaron. Appreciate it. All thanks, right. guys. Take care. Thank you. Thank you.